In the 1800s, a ghostly blight drifted over Russia's tobacco fields, splashing deadly blotches on emerald leaves and choking farms. In Pasteur and Koch's theories, people believe that each terrifying plague could be traced to micro under a microscope. Botanist Dmitry Ivanovsky patiently passed diseased tobacco leaf sap through Chamberlain's porcelain filter again and again, trapping every visible bacterium until the crystal clear filtrate seemed utterly sterile. However, when he put the clear liquid on healthy leaves, the ghostly blotches reappeared. Ivanovsky recorded everything correctly, but his conclusion was wrong. He blamed the filter or a certain unknown toxin and refused to admit that the ghost he had seen was real. Later in Netherlands, Bajerink repeated the experiment. He filtered and repeatedly diluted sap. Even diluted a hundredfold, the disease still remained lethal and could multiply to new plants. No way it's a toxin. Bajerink shattered bacteriology's dogma, declaring that it's tinier and simpler than bacteria. He named it virus, from word deadly poison in Latin. Was the ghostly agent a living creature or mere dust? In 1935, meticulous chemist Wendell Stanley finally silenced the debate by crystallizing and so deactivating the tobacco mosaic virus. He crushed a ton of infected leaves, purified them, and finally found needle crystals that resembled salt in the bottom. They seemed normal, but once in water, they awakened to devastate a whole tobacco field. The New York Times exclaimed that this changed people's view of life and death. Outside the cell, the virus is a bunch of inert chemical molecules. Once inside, it instantly revives and transforms into a replicating machine. In 1939, electron microscopes finally captured the true look of tobacco mosaic virus. Tiny, neatly arranged particles. They are typically much simpler than cells mostly consisting of a protein shell encasing a few genes. How does it work? When battling a dysentery outbreak in World War I, DRL noticed that Shigella dysentery colonies on a Petri dish always had transparent plaques. When inoculated onto new ones, same bright spots would appear, as if something was eating the bacteria. DRL boldly proposed that it's a virus that hunt, infect, and destroy bacteria, naming these agents bacteriophages. Skeptical scientists ridiculed the idea until electron microscope finally unveiled the predators in detail. The bacteriophage, a tiny UFO-looking machine, lands precisely on the surface of bacteria, grips the cell wall with its tail fibers, and then, like a syringe, forcibly injects its internal genetic material into the unsuspecting cell, leaving the virus's protein coat outside. Once the genetic material enters the cell, it immediately forced the cell to stop all its activity and start to frantically produce hundreds of, even thousands of copies for its new host. Ultimately, the drained bacterial cell bursts and dissolves, sending countless new viral landing pods towards next target. Certain temperate phages weave their viral genes into the host chromosome, lying dormant through countless cell divisions until stress signals abruptly awaken them transforming the unsuspecting bacterium into an obedient factory that churns out fresh phage particles. After this, humans learn how to deal with it. In the mid 20th century, polio was the nightmare of parents. It paralyzed countless children for life. Physician Jonas Salk made an inactivated vaccine by inactivating the polio virus with formaldehyde while preserving its physical characteristics. In 1955, the Sock vaccine was declared a success, almost completely taming this nightmare. Sock abandoned vaccine patents saying, no one can patent the sun. From then on, we seem to have mastered the rules of the virus game, recognize it, dismantle it, and then defeat it. For a time, human confidence was surging, as if the end of all viruses was near, but a more complex and cunning machine soon shattered this optimism. In 1983, Montagnier and his colleagues at Pasteur Institute in France isolated a new virus from an AIDS patient. The HIV machine completely overturned the law of biology. It could reverse engineer its own genetic information, RNA, into human genes, DNA, becoming part of our cellular instructions. It targets not ordinary cells, but the immune system. Patients die 
from various opportunistic infections. We are no longer facing a simple machine, but a ghost hacker that can lurk, mutate, and rewrite the blueprint of our lives. Entering the 21st century, gene sequencing technology has advanced by leaps and bounds. From SARS to COVID-19, we can identify them within days and develop mRNA vaccines, transmit machinery of the virus, allowing the immune system to rehearse and precisely attack. When scientists finally read our entire genome, they uncovered the most mind-bending fact about viruses. About 8% of our DNA is made of ancient viral fragments. They are retroviruses that infected our ancestors millions of years ago. From then on, their genes are in our blood forever. Initially, we thought this was just an accident. However, discoveries revealed that the gene for a protein responsible for cell fusion of the human placenta originated from an ancient viral sequence. Without that ancient invasion, there would be no human beings today. Our relationship with viruses is reconstructed. It is not a live or die struggle, but a co-evolution lasted for billions of years. The struggles drive the evolution of immune system. The integration shapes our life forms today. Perhaps life is not a closed self, but an open system constantly invaded, rewritten, and reorganized. Over billions of years, viruses, the oldest and largest information stream on the planet, have been transmitted and exchanged between different species. Therefore, the next time a ghost visits, it may bring thorns or sparks of fire. Who knows? This depends on whether we have learned to open the source code it handed us with awe and imagination, beyond panic and greed. 